of the black community and the public at large. I have seen the news media literally hide their trucks so that they would not be in a position to have to cover the demonstrations in front of Cobo Hall, only to bring them out after the demonstrators had left. This is an outrage that the black community is having the life of its babies destroyed and the NAACP and the media are knowingly conspiring to keep this information from the public. This is an outrage and it should be dealt with by every fair-minded American. The civil rights elite has forgotten the lives of unborn black children and has joined those who choose to kill them. Unbelievable! They have forgotten that in the past Racists snatched black babies from their mother's arms and sold them into slavery. Today they snatch them from their mother's womb and throw them in the garbage. Ishmael Hernandez, Executive Director, African and Caribbean American Center, 2003. When we look at this issue of civil rights leaders who sell out, even when they clearly know that birth control and abortion are being used for black genocide, we need to understand that by the 1960s, population control, especially black population control, had become almost a religion for America's white power structure. And from the start, they made it clear that if you crossed them, or if you challenged their agenda, they would chop you off at the knees. And that remains true to this day. Whether you're talking about the liberal social engineers who control the Democratic Party, or the wealthy elitists who control the Republican Party, or the media, or the academic community, these people have created a kind of family planning cartel that does not tolerate dissent. And they have always been especially ruthless about this when it comes to African Americans. A perfect example of this was seen in the case of Samuel Yett. Mr. Yett was an award-winning journalist who had earned a master's degree from Indiana University, was a U.S. Air Force veteran of the Korean War, and served as special assistant for civil rights to the director of the U.S. Office of Economic Opportunity. He was also a professor of journalism at Howard University and a columnist for several magazines and newspapers. In 1968, Yet had become the first African-American reporter hired by Newsweek magazine and he quickly became their Washington, D.C. bureau correspondent. But then three years later, he wrote a book that exposed high-level plans within the United States to use birth control and abortion as instruments of black genocide. Then immediately after his book was released to the public, yet was called into his supervisor's office and fired. At that meeting, he was informed that his dismissal had been orchestrated by the Nixon White House. The next year, Yet told the New York Times that pressure had been put on Newsweek to get him out of Washington. Then later, despite the fact that his book was selling well, had received at least two national awards and was being used as a textbook in over 100 colleges, Gett's publisher dropped him and the book went off the market. What's important to recognize about this situation and others like it was that this family planning cartel was sending a message to those who might have influence within the African American community. Whether they were politicians or journalists or college professors or civil rights leaders, they were being warned that when it comes to population control, they only had two options. They could either get on board with it or they could keep their mouths shut. And when people like Samuel Yett told them what they could do with their two options, they paid a price that few others had the character or the courage to pay. The copyright to Samuel Yett's book was eventually given back to him. Then in 1982, Yet used his own money to republish it. The foreword of that edition was written by a well-known civil rights activist and co-founder of both the Harlem Writers Guild and the National Cultural Committee of the NAACP. His name was John Oliver Kellins and, in that foreword, he gave his analysis of the relationship between family planning and the black community. The American ruling class had made a hard decision. Americans of African descent would either accept the miserable lot or die. 
the venerable Saturday Evening Post issued what might be termed as a white paper in which it warned black America that they had better understand and accept the fact that absolute freedom and equality were not part of the game plan for them and that the consequence of non-acceptance would be wholesale genocide. John Oliver Killens, 1982. The minister's work is also important, and also he should be trained, perhaps by the Federation, as to our ideals and the goal that we hope to reach. We do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population, and the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. In 1939, Margaret Sanger wrote that in a letter to fellow eugenicist Clarence Gamble regarding the American Birth Control League's Negro Project. Gamble was an heir to the Procter & Gamble fortune and a major financial backer of Sanger's. He also provided funding for other eugenics projects and even gave money directly to the North Carolina Eugenics Board that sterilized Elaine Riddick. In fact, in 1947, he called for the expansion of that state's sterilization program, saying that for every feeble-minded person sterilized, 40 more were polluting and degrading the bloodlines of future generations with their defective genes. Sanger's letter makes it clear that the eugenics movement understood they would need to neutralize the opposition they might get from the church. They also knew that this would be especially crucial within the African-American community. Their strategy was to manipulate church leadership into selling the illusion that support for eugenics was not inconsistent with the Christian faith. To do this, they would often recruit pastors to be front men for eugenics policies and provide them with prepackaged sermons on eugenics. They also held contests in which awards would be given to the ministers who came up with the best pro-eugenic sermons on their own. This approach proved so effective that an almost identical strategy would be adopted by the American abortion lobby. In January of 1973, the Supreme Court legalized abortion on demand throughout the United States, and almost immediately, the Religious Coalition for Abortion Rights was formed. Less than a year earlier, the following conversation had taken place in the Oval Office of the White House. It began on the 30th of March, 1972, and continued four days later on the 3rd of April. This is an actual recording of that conversation. The speakers are the President of the United States, Republican Richard Nixon, and members of his senior staff. A majority of people in Colorado are for abortion. I think a majority of people in Michigan are for abortion. I think in both cases, well, certainly in Michigan, they will vote for it because they think the bus going to be aborted generally are the little black bastards. As I told you, we talked about it earlier, that a hell of a lot of people want to control the Negro bastards. Yeah. Isn't that very true? We're so, talking about population control. Sure. We're talking really in what John Rockefeller really realizes. Look, the people in what we call our class control their population. Sometimes they'll have a man of a six or seven or eight or nine. But it's exception. The people who don't control their families are people then the people that shouldn't have kids. Now that's the black the black population. Black population in the city of San Francisco has gone from three thousand right after World War II to where they represent thirty percent of the population of San Francisco. Yes, sir. The Religious Coalition for Abortion Rights was originally created with the financial backing of John Rockefeller, and its current president is an African American who was once appointed to the Washington, D.C. City Council by Richard Nixon. In the early 1990s, the organization changed its name and is today known as the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice. In 1969, a meeting of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, also known as UNESCO, proposed that an American Population Commission be created with a, quote, large budget for propaganda, unquote. Four months later, Republican President Richard Nixon signed legislation establishing the Commission on Population Growth and the American Future. 
The bill authorizing this new initiative had been passed with overwhelming support from congressional Democrats and was chaired by John Rockefeller. The executive director of the project was to be Dr. Charles F. Westhoff, who was also a member of both the American Eugenics Society and Planned Parenthood's National Advisory Council. Another member of this new commission was Dr. Joseph Beasley. In the 1960s, Beasley oversaw an aggressive eugenics program that concentrated on black neighborhoods in New Orleans with the stated intention of lowering welfare costs. This project would eventually be described by Planned Parenthood President Alan Guttmacher as the number one success story in the history of American birth control movement. It also led to Beasley being elected chairman of the board of Planned Parenthood in 1970. Then in 1975, Beasley was sent to federal prison for conspiring to defraud the U.S. government of $778,000 that had been allocated for the project. In court, a local black civil rights activist named Sherman